Fox Sports. We are Fox. We are Last night, Alex Wood and Jose Fernandez put on a record-setting show. What does a pitch like that sound like? That's 14 for Fernandez. A pitcher's duel never before seen in Major League Baseball. Down goes Stanton. Wow. 28 strikeouts combined tonight, no walks, and Jose Fernandez outdueled Alex Wood. But today's a new day, and Aaron Harang returns to the mound, hoping to extend his streak of hitless innings as well as the Braves lead the National League East. Today, it's Game 3 against the Fish, the Marlins and Braves. The series is on the line next. It's another perfect spring day in Atlanta. We're all season long. Braves baseball is brought to you by Academy Sports and Outdoors. The right stuff, the low price every day. We welcome you inside Turner Field for a business fan special. And it's the third final and rubber game of our three game set with the much improved Miami Marlins. The Marlins outdueled Alex Wood last night by a final score of 1 0. Atlanta has revenge on its mind today. Hi again, friends. Joe Tom and Chip back with you for game three. We saw a lot of fastballs, a lot of strikeouts, and historic pitching performances last night. Today, it's Nathan Evaldi's turn for the Marlins to try to win this series outright against the Braves. Yeah, for the Braves, nothing much changes. And if you think, well, you're going to have a somewhat of a hangover from all the strikeouts last night, well, you got no time to rest today because it's a quick turnaround, and Nate Evaldi is very much like Fernandez in that he throws hard. He's got a hard breaking ball. There are his numbers so far for the year, and he has in the past pitched brilliantly against Atlanta and got nothing to show for it. He'll be a tough customer today. And speaking of pitching brilliance, where would the Braves, Tommy, be without Aaron Harang? He has been magnificent since putting on a Braves uniform. Yeah, it's probably an understatement to say he's been a pleasant surprise, but he really has been fantastic. Another guy coming off a strong start his last time out, seven shutout innings. It's a great ball game, and for him, the turnaround really seems to be about all about commanding that down and away strike, particularly with his fastball. You see there some of his numbers that you know you, you kind of have to rub your eyes and, and see if you're reading that the right way. But second in the National League in ERA, going batting average against is fantastic. So he's been everything and more that the Braves could want, and look for him to continue what he's been doing all season long again here today. We've got one of the best seats in the house. Perhaps the best seat belongs to Gerald Lair. He'll talk with Tom Hart about Atlanta's unlikely ace, Aaron Harang when we come back to Turner Field right after this.
Braves baseball as Atlanta looks for the series win against Miami. Welcome back to Turner Field. I'm Tom Hart. Aaron Harang gets the ball today, and unlike yesterday, where it was raw stuff from two young pitchers going head-to-head, Harang brings something different. He brings stuff and smarts, and according to his catcher, Gerald Laird, that experience is invaluable. It comes with experience. It comes with the game started where he understands how to, you know, call his own game and, uh, and, and uh, stay in control and, and, and make every pitch. You know, for younger guys, it's, it's tough to be able to call your game and then make the pitch. So you know, they rely on the catcher a lot. So with him, I mean, I have an idea what he likes to do and where he's going in and at bat. And uh, I just try to put down the right fingers. Aaron Harang is with his ninth different organization. He's been in the bigs for 13 years, and he's compiled some heady numbers. He ranks in the top ten among active pitchers in career wins, starts, innings pitched, and strikeouts. Today is start number 324. And, yeah, he's been fantastic as of late. That DeLorean was loaded up. The flux capacitor is working. Harang has gone back to the future, and he looks to continue that run today as he makes another start for the Braves. Play-by-play is next. Braves baseball was presented by AT&T U-verse, Delta Airlines, and Ford. It's a beautiful day for baseball. Not a cloud in the sky, but a very brisk wind is blowing across the ballpark from the left field corner toward the right. And that's big Aaron Harang who takes the ball for the Braves. Remember, he started the Atlanta home opener. And he'll get after this Miami Marlins starting lineup brought to you by Toyota. Christian Yelich has a 16 game hit streak. He leads things off. Ozuna, Stanton, Garrett Jones, the cleanup man. Casey McGee has been a nice pickup back from Japan. He's had a good run over the last 10 for the Marlins. We'll get our first look at Derek Dietrich in a starting assignment today with Echeverria, Mathis, and Nathan Evaldi, the lower third. Facing Aaron Harang, making his fifth start in the year, 3 and 1 with an 0-7 ERA, coming off a seven inning no hit, no run performance in New York, and you see his ranks on the season. I'm going to go out to Lem and say if all of those continue to stay first in the league, he's going to have a heck of a year. <laughs> yeah, I'd say that would be a good call. He is five and four lifetime against the Florida Marlins, Miami Marlins, excuse me. His four keys to pitching success today. How low can he go? My goodness, seven innings of no hit, no run ball in New York. How long can that continue? And also, he's been pitching down in the strike zone, which has been a real key to his success. And walks versus hits. He still has given up quite a few walks, 12 walks in 25 innings, including six the other day 
in New York when he no hit the New York Mets. So he'd like to cut down on those a little bit too. Well, if you're going to walk guys, you better not give up hits. Yep, can't have both. And this guy's been picking up hits by the bushel full. This is Kristen Yelich. He's riding a 16 game hitting streak for Miami. He extended that run last night with a bunt single in the first half of the night against Alex Wood. <laughs> 68 degrees, the official temperature at the ballpark. Feels cooler than that with the brisk breeze. Outside to Yelich, evens the count of ball and a strike. Three guys in the middle of the order have faced Harang before, but no one else, so it'll be to his advantage, including against Kristen Yelich. Fastball well located, and Yelich missed it. Two balls, two strikes. And right down Broadway, Yelich took strike three call. Good start for Aaron. Yep, obviously. Uh, Looking for something else. That's kind of Cliff Lee like right there. <laughs> Throw a bunch of other pitches and then strike them out on a fastball down the middle. Marcelo Zuna hitting 312 for Miami. He had a good year going last year before he hurt his thumb. Lost for the season. He settled in very nicely behind Yelich and in front of Giancarlo Stanton. Might not be a better place in this Marlins lineup to hit than the two spot for Ozuna. Despite that good fortune, he's had a quiet series. He's one for eight. That hit a third inning single at the onset of the set. Three homers, 12 RBIs for Ozuna. And just did stay alive at nothing in two. That's well hit to center. The wind, though, is blowing in, and Schaefer is there. He's got it. Mother Nature helped harangue there. Schaefer tracked it down for the second out of the inning, and here's a look at the rest of the Braves' defensive lineup. Both Upton brothers get the day off, so Ryan Domit starts in left, Schaefer in center, Jason Hayward in right. Standard alignment around the infield, and as Tom Hart mentioned a moment ago, Gerald Laird is behind the plate today. That ball was smacked, boys. Yes, it was. Wind blowing straight in in that direction. Yeah, they're going to they're going to hit it in the air. Keep it to the middle of the ballpark, especially for the little guys. That's got to feel good knowing that even with a guy like Stanton up there and his mammoth power, that you can throw your Sunday best fastball in the inner half and have a chance to survive the matchup. Mm -hmm. Side one and two. And you talked about Aaron Harang using the big part of the ballpark. That's how he pitched in his last start. Yes. Lots of fly balls to center field at City Field. One already at home today. One and two for Stanton. Stays alive. Swing and a miss at a breaking ball. Aaron Harang continues the strikeout run. 
for the starters in this series. He has two in a scoreless first inning. Outs, one looking, one swinging, and now the Braves go to work, hoping to score a run against another tough right-hander for Miami. Chris Johnson anchors the Toyota starting nine. He's off to a good start, as we chronicled a few moments ago, and in the last seven games, hitting 310 on the button. He'll be facing Nathan Ivaldi, making his fifth start of the year. One and one with a 3.55 ERA. You see his numbers against the Braves in six starts. One and one with a 2.19 ERA. Not. Uh, not a whole lot of run support for this guy most of the time, and he's pitched pretty well against the Braves. If you liked fastballs last night, you're going to see a whole lot more today. That's our work scouting report. He is throwing more sliders than he used to, and his walks to strikeout ratio is just so outstanding. You saw a graphic on that. Three walks against 23 strikeouts in 25 innings. Ivaldi was not born and raised a Marlin. He was a Dodger. As Hayward faces an 0-2 count and fought off that breaking ball. Much was made and at the time probably justifiably so about the Marlins signing all those big ticket free agents and then cleaning house. One of the first names that left was Hanley Ramirez. He went to the Dodgers. Nathan Ivaldi was the principal piece that came back to Miami in that trade. Well, there's an awful lot left to be written about this 2014 season. It appears that the strategy the Marlins employed is working. As Hayward broke his bat and guides one into center field. Big turnaround first for Jason. He'll stop there with a leadoff hit. When I got here today, I went into the clubhouse and I sought out Chris Johnson and Jason Hayward. I shook both their hands and I told them that last night they were the greatest hitters in all of Major League Baseball because they got hits off of Fernandez, which was it seemed impossible last night. So here's Jason leading off again with a base hit broken bat variety or not. It counts and a good start. Wow split lengthwise along the barrel. And here we're now a five game hitting streak. And on in front of Andleton Simmons. With Upton getting the day off today, Simmons becomes, guys, the ideal number two hitter on this ball club with his excellent plate discipline. Now, the fact that he doesn't strike out is perfect when he's got somebody on, ba on base in front of him. And the toughest guy to strike out in the game just twice in 74 plate appearances. <laughs> Slider rebuked. One ball, one strike. Probably seeing a lot of pitches to hit because he's got the pitcher protecting him in the lineup. I'm just saying. Don't. No. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> 
how about that number? <laughs> Simmons, a lifetime 322 hitter, batting second. I mean, it's a good spot for him in the lineup. There's no question about it. Um, but you know, he's done a great job in the in the eight hole as well when he's down there, and that's certainly not an easy place to hit. Low two balls and a strike. This guy Valdi against the Braves. I mentioned earlier that he'd had tough luck against Atlanta. The first time he faced him, six innings, one run, no decision. Back in 2012, eight innings, four hit shutout, no decision. Last year, in August, seven innings of one hit shutout ball with eight strikeouts, no decision. He did beat them. On September 1st here at Turner Field, eight innings of seven hit shutout baseball and struck out six. Uh, here's the active leader in terms of lowest run support per start at three, and that number's jumped up only because he's had a little bit of run support so far early on this year. Simmons drives one toward right. The wind will push that out toward Giancarlo Stanton. He makes the play. Hayward back to first one out. Is that hard to put out of your mind, Tom? When you pitch as well as Evaldi has and you don't get the results you want? It is because, you know, you're you're judged by how many games you win and lose, you know, and, and there's it's only you can only go so far with, hey man, nice job. You know, I mean, yeah. It, yeah, you know your teammates appreciate the fact that you're going out there and and giving you a giving them a chance to win. But every other Joe Schmo is looking at the box score and sees that your record is, you know, four and ten because you know they think you stink. You know, so it only it only can take you so far. And you know, even the run support thing, you can put that out of your mind every every get, every start. But eventually, when you start to get to the middle of the game and you don't have any runs in that game either, then it gets to be, okay, here we go again. Another one of these days. Freddie Freeman, the batter. I understand Freddie's been battling a dry eye issue the last couple of days. This wind blowing in his face is not going to help today. No. Freddie's pulled for his last 12. They listen back to back games for the Braves for the first time this year. He went back on the post play at first. So, Tom, you're not one of those guys that thinks we should discount the win or the loss for that matter for a starting pitcher. No. Thank you. I don't know how else you would judge him. Two balls, no strikes. I think we all. To some extent, hate the term "quality start" because of what what it represents. Um, so I don't I don't know what you would come up with to to judge a pitcher by if you're not going by wins and losses. That's outside now. Three and O to Freeman. General managers will say, "Hey, give me five guys who can all pitch 200 innings, and the wins and losses will take care of themselves." Right? Totally agree. I mean, and that was always the mindset we had was, you know, if we pitch 200 innings every year. Everything's going to take care of itself, and it'll usually be pretty good. Freddie had a 3 0 green light and missed a 93 mile an hour pitch. That was kind of a his batting practice fastball, if you will, at 93. Everything else has been 95, 96. He's walked three. In 25 and two thirds innings now, but two of those, if you want to put any weight on that, two of the three walks came in his last start against Seattle. Another no decision. He only gave up one earned run in six innings, and his strikeouts were down a little bit too. Two walks and four strikeouts. Jason, a good lead at first. He's running. And the pitch is high, ball four. So good call, Joe. If all the issues an early walk, and Braves in business in the first inning, two on, one out for Chris Johnson. Hey, after last night, knowing how good this guy is, I'm trying to find any chink in the armor anywhere. And, and yeah, an early run, he's thinking I, I might be down five nothing with only one run across. The lack of run support that you're talking about.
So here's Chris Johnson. We talked about him during Braves Live. His bats come to life over the last week or so. And he pops up the first pitch right side. Garrett Jones in foul ground now. The ring plays tricks with that. And he caught that at the end of the webbing. Hayward thought about tagging up on the play, but wisely held his ground at second. Johnson pops up. Two on, two out. This wind is going to be an adventure to, for everybody today. Yeah, you're going to have to. Ball's on that side of the field. You're going to have to be ready to keep drifting and keep going after him. And ball's down a third baseline. You better not give up on him too early. Nope. Ryan Domit starts in left for the Braves today. No homers and RBI for Ryan, batting 143. Unlike the Marlins against Harang, the Braves against Ivaldi, everybody in the lineup today has faced him except for Domit. Talking to some scouts this morning about Fernandez, and one of the things they said about his effort was how impressive it was and how often he threw that front door or inside slider for a taken strike to right handers and then a slider away for a swinging strike on a pitch that wasn't a strike. They said it just happened time and time again last night. Two balls, two strikes. And I thought he. Nice chair. I thought he made it look effortless. Oh, he did. I mean, when you're on like that, it, it looks a whole lot easier than it is. But when you have that kind of stuff, you, I guess you expect to pitch that kind of game. Fly ball center Ozuna says he's got it, and he does. Ivaldi issues a hit and a walk. Strands two Braves and a scoreless bottom of the first. of the Atlanta Braves and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of the Atlanta Braves. Aaron Harang leads Nate Evaldi 2-0 in strikeouts after one inning, but still no score as the Marlins come up for inning number two. Jones, McGee, and Derek Dietrich are the hitters.
very late swing from Garrett Jones. He and Harang locked horns, I'm sure, in their National League Central days. Jones with the Pirates, Harang with the Reds. Popped up. This is one of those that might blow back for Chris Johnson. Near the rail. Into the dugout it goes. 0 and 2. Almost came back. Got to play every one of the balls in the air like it's going to stay in the park. Strike three over the outside corner. No sticky situations for Aaron Harang so far, but perhaps one for the Marlins in their dugout. We'll explain in a sec. See what Chris did on that pop fly attempt? Missed it. Gum dugout. <laughs> and he's hearing about it still. Casey McGee, the hitter, the Marlins third baseman, 16 RBIs. And the game winning RBI in the fourth inning last night after Giancarlo Stanton doubled, McGee singled him home. Fly ball to right. And Hayward will get there. Jason's got it. Two down. The one simple reason that Aaron Harang was not able to have an opportunity to finish his no hitter in New York was pitch count. Because of those six walks and some deep counts, at the end of seven innings, he had thrown 121 pitches, and Freddy Gonzalez was not going to run the risk of him going out for two more innings and really racking up a lot. So he's off to a great start here today, only 20 so far, and three of them are the only ones that have missed the strike zone. Which Freddie not wanting to risk long term was probably the, the best thing her hand could have heard. You know, yeah. I think, you know, everybody thinking he's coming in here on a temporary basis until all the troops come back, so to speak. And, you know, the fact that they're thinking long term with him tells you how he's pitched and how he's figuring into their plans going forward. That's a good point. We had been led to believe that Mike Miner was to pitch this weekend for Atlanta. That's not going to be the case. We mentioned this last night. He's going to make one more rehab assignment. Freddie Gonzalez said, look in the spring, in the spring when guys start the year, we try to get him six starts in the spring. This will be Mike Miner's sixth start, stretch him out to 100 pitches, and then we'll be certain he's ready to go. Broken bat to second. Douglas got it, and the flip to first is in time. Harang is breezing. Six outs on 24 pitches. Smooth as silk is the king size right hander against the Marlins so far today.
well. Aaron Harang has his no hitter. It's spread out over three games. He's up to 10 hitless innings in a row for the Braves and a perfect start today. Today only get a $31 club reserve seat to see the Braves take on the Giants Friday, May 2nd through the 4th with the Braves Steal of the Week. Tickets include $10 in added value. That's $31 seats in the club level next weekend, normally a $42 value. Those tickets must be purchased by midnight tonight, so visit Braves.com to order. Takes a fastball for a strike. It's an even count. You had an interesting conversation with him comparing sliders after last night's game. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, you know, we talked about it last night how his slider last night reminded us of Smoltz's. And I asked, I asked Dan what he thought, and, and he thought Smoltz's was better. Uh, that John's was more of a Kind of that disappearing slider, like it looked like a fastball for so long, and then it just exploded and was out of the zone. And with Fernandez, it was a little bit. Um... Wow! If Aldi gets his first strikeout, he takes care of Ugla on a check swing. And that was a pretty good slider there too. But he talked about how with Fernandez, it was a little bit more that it looked like a fastball coming out of his hand similar to, to John's but then it had a little bit more of a of a hump in it so it looked a, it, it was a little bit more of a maybe a mix between a slider and a curveball than John's was but nasty nonetheless <laughs> but in a, you know a little bit different way but he thought Smoltz's was better Jordan Schaefer the hitter for the Braves and he's a little late well, the comments Joe I read was one of the hitters and I can't remember who it's really tough to hit a pitch that looks like it's going to start on one side of the plate and ends up all the way across the plate. I'm just hoping Smoltz isn't watching. Oh. That's all I'm hoping. A Q shot speared by McGee at third, and he gets a fast runner with a terrific play. In on the grass, McGee cut it off and threw out Schaefer. Well, that's the second lefty he's really gotten in on. Remember, Hayward had his bat splintered. I don't know if that was a fastball or slider, but he got right in on his thumbs. That strikeout of Ugla, that slider wasn't a big one. It was pretty short, but hard. No balls and a strike for Gerald Laird, starting for the sixth time for the Braves behind the plate. Can't get there. Gerald Laird with an opposite field single. There's that man again, Joe, doing something to help the ball club from an offensive standpoint, too. Every game he does something good. That was not where he wanted that fastball. Nope, trying to go away and throw it on the inside corner. And wasn't a bad pitch. No. Found the right spot for it. So Aaron Harang will be cleared here in the second inning. Aaron's 0 for 10. It in play to short. And Chavaria will flip to second, and that retires the side. The Braves get their second hit, but strand Gerald Laird, and we head to the third.
third, but it is a windy day, and that has caused issues for Freddie Freeman as of late. As reported by Carol Rogers of the AJC, Freeman has been suffering through some eye issues since the weekend and the windy conditions in New York at City Field. He has a hard time wearing glasses at the plate because of peripheral vision, but that wind and contact issues have dried his eyes out, so he's been taking extra drops. He sleeps with a gel in his eyes, and he even had time with a quick game last night to go see the team optometrist, Dr. David Ross, to try and figure out a solution. We'll see if he can get that situated at the plate where he's still looking for his first hit this series. Thank you very much, Tom. So for the fans who ask all the time on Twitter why Freddie wears glasses in the field but not at the plate, there's your answer. He doesn't need him at the plate. A day like today, though, if the wind is a problem for drying his eyes out, might be a good day just to wear him to block the wind a little. Echeverria bouncing ball up the middle and on the first pitch, he has the first hit of the game for Miami. First hit allowed by Harang in 10 innings. This is Jeff Mathis, the catcher. Mathis was also part of that big blockbuster deal with Toronto, as was Echeverria, the man who stands at first. Turned out to be a hundred loss year for the Marlins last year started even worse for Mathis. His season debut was delayed until May. He broke his collarbone in the first spring training game last February last season. If that was on a foul ball a foul tip. I can't imagine how painful that must have been. Yeah, I didn't think about that. I was thinking collision, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. And you're thinking, man, that early in spring training. But yeah, if it was a foul ball, yeah, that would hurt. So Marlins feel pretty good about their catching situation. Jared Saltalamacchia is the number one guy. Math is a very capable veteran backup. Played a lot of games with the Angels and their catching taskmaster master manager Mike Sosha. Story about Mike Sosha, his young catching core during spring training, he would bring the catcher in after the defensive inning was over and sit down with the catcher and say, Take me through every pitch. And they'd have to name it what the pitch, what they called, why. As hit and runs on, and Mathis fouled it away. Point being, every pitch has a purpose, and if the catcher doesn't know or remember what the sequence was or what's going on, got some issues. And Mathis performed those duties very, very well with the Angels. Something that man could appreciate. Another big lead at first for Echevarria as Harang readies for the 2 2 pitch. And Mathis missed it. Harang has another strikeout. That's number four today. <laughs> well, Evaldi gets no run support. Let's see if he can help himself. Two for seven this year. Already with some sacrifices, well, with one sacrifice, excuse me. You know, Warren Spahn used to say about no run support throw a shutout and hit a home run, you can't lose. I like it. I don't know if I like his chance of hitting a home run, but the other party's got a chance. Bonds it foul again. 0 oh 2.
That stat you're talking about. Tom hit a home run throw a shutout. First guy to do that. He's a man who. Shares a bit of baseball history that. Wood and Fernandez took part in last night. As Evaldi with two strikes bunts it foul. That's a gift strikeout for Harang, his fifth of the day. Remember the name Long Tom Hughes? No. Long Tom Hughes was the first ever man to hit a homer and count for the only run in, of a game and pitch a shutout. That was in 1906. He and a guy named Noodles Han hooked up in that game. Jose Fernandez and Alex Wood, second time since 1900, two pitchers 23 or younger, both had 11 strikeouts in the same game. Noodles Han and Long Tom Hughes were the others. You know the funny part about Long Tom Hughes? He was 5'9. <laughs> <laughs> you say, was there a short Tom Hughes, or I mean, what, what was with the distinction? People were just shorter in those days. Yes, they were. And Noodles Han, a little bit of history about him. First man to throw a no hitter in the 20th century. And he was from Nashville, Tennessee, Braves country. As Yelich digs in, 1 0 count, and outside, ball two. Saw Brett Butler yesterday and talked to him a little bit, the new third base coach for the Marlins, and he now lives in the Phoenix area. He worked for several years in the Diamondbacks organization and just relocated there. And one of his children, his grandchild, are there, so it's that's home now for him. But good to see him back here in Atlanta. Three balls and a strike for Yelich. Good hitters count. Runner goes. Pitch swung on and missed. Laird's throw to second is going to be in time. <laughs> Gerald Laird throws out Echevarria. That ends the Marlins third. And the top of the Braves order is featured on our Delta Airlines on deck when we come back scoreless. Let's take a look at today's SunTrust Shining Moment. Giving you a little history already today. 
A lot more history on this date in baseball history. First of all, happy birthday, Wrigley Field. The Cubs are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the first ever game played there today. And the aforementioned Warren Spahn's birthday. Ted Williams and Hank hit their first home runs on this date a few years apart. A couple of cool trivia things about Wrig Wrigley Field. The Chicago Bears are the only Chicago team ever to win a championship at Wrigley Field. <laughs> but number two, besides take me out to the ball game, there's a tradition that started at Wrigley Field that occurs in every single ballpark 40, 50 times a game. That fans, broadcasters, writers alike take for granted. Any guesses as to what that is? Happens 40 to 50 times a, a game, game. Mm -hmm. per game. New baseballs brought out. Close. You're on the right track. Why would you bring out new baseballs? Because they were lost for foul balls. That's exactly right. Charles Wiegman, who owned the Cubs franchise when it was then Wiegman Park. Began the practice in 1915 of allowing fans to keep fly balls, foul balls, as souvenirs. Hmm. In the old days, fly ball would go in the stands, an usher would come and take it, and they'd put it back in play. As Amber takes low, three balls, two strikes, and the point Wiegman was trying to make was this game is easily accessible for the fans, a wonderful memory, but the game was healthy enough that they could afford the luxury of allowing the baseballs to be taken home instead of reused. Sharply hit to second. Dietrich, who's had some defensive issues, handled that one cleanly. And Hayward's one for two with a third inning ground out. See, I learned something today. Thank you. Tune in to our broadcast. You're just you're going to learn something. <laughs> May not be <laughs> the most pertinent of information, no, but you can learn I'm something. I'm serious. I'm not kidding. Yeah, I, I learned something. That's great. But I know that's a special park for you. I mean, a special park for me, obviously, for family reasons, but right. for you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was a pretty good spot to win my 300th game for sure. And yeah, Simmons is the batter. I think you're the only guy that's ever won 300 there, right? Yeah. That's still, that's still uh -huh. the case. Nowadays, I like my chances of being the only one. Yeah, at least for a, a good long while, that's for sure. Cued towards short at Chivaria. First, first in time, and Simmons is retired. Round number two. But I just love that that shining moment. It's, it's so cool how history's circles all seem to come together. Who would have thought that Ted Williams and Henry Aaron's first home run would come on the same day? Same day, yeah. Stan Musial, Stan Musial and Ken Griffey Jr. born in the same town on the same day. Two of the greatest players in the history of the game. It's funny how that works. I wonder how long it took everybody else to buy into the foul ball thing. Because you know there was a thought then that well then we need to get cheaper balls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or somewhere somebody was saying, well wait a minute, we're not doing as good as they are. We can't yeah. afford that. One ball, one strike. It's funny you mention that because when the Cubs played in one of their early World Series, they played the Boston Red Sox, but the World Series games weren't played at Wiegman Park. It wasn't big enough. They played them across town at Comiskey Park. The Cubs lost that World Series because they were unfamiliar with the way the ballpark played. The visiting Red Sox had a better idea. Yeah, they had more experience over there. 98, that last fastball. And 97 got Freeman. The Marlins are given the Braves first baseman fits in this series, and Evaldi has a perfect home third.
today. He's seen a lot in his 13 years in the big leagues. He's also been through a couple of injury scares. One of the oddest was when he had to undergo an appendectomy in 2009 when he was pitching for the Cincinnati Reds. The team was in Pittsburgh, and when they got to the Pittsburgh hospital, they were informed they could only do an open appendectomy, which is not what Harang nor the Reds wanted. So he rolled the dice a little bit. He got in a car with a member of the clubhouse staff, and they made the drive from Pittsburgh all the way back to Cincinnati, alerting every hospital along the route that Harang may be stopping in for an emergency ah. appendectomy. They got to Cincinnati just in time, pulled up in front of the emergency room. He walked in, was admitted, and about 15 minutes later, they opened him up and able to take that uh, appendix out. Similar to how Jason Hayward has hid his appendectomy last season in Colorado laparoscopically, which allowed him to recover quicker. That is taking a chance. A new set of strikes for Yelich. He was in the batter's box when Echeverria was thrown out trying to steal, but it didn't help him. Aaron Harang has struck out six men in three and a third innings today. I mean, this is amazing. Who is this guy? He's working both sides of the plate. He's just a little off the plate when he gets ahead in the count, creating some swings out of the zone. But I, I've said since his first start that I think it's just that his plane on his delivery is sharp downhill. He's six seven, but he's keeping the ball down. He's keeping it at the bottom line of the strike zone. Cue ball toward the mound. Soon as an easy out, that's the second out. That worked for you guys, didn't it, Tommy, with Leo? Down well, and away strikes? You can you can command that down and away strike. You can get a lot of guys out on that alone. And when you establish that and the hitter has to respect it, now you mix in your other stuff and you show you can throw that for strikes. It makes it really hard for a hitter to stand in the box and settle on a pitch or a location. And we've said it a million times what an inexact science scouting is. What did Cleveland not see out of Aaron Harang this spring? He had bad numbers. He did not have a good spring. I, I don't know if they were not able to see through those numbers or not, but his results weren't good. Quickly ahead of Stanton. And off fly foul back toward us. Dusty Baker said he thought he was the best he had seen when he was in Cincinnati at hitting that down and away strike. Down and away gets Stanton. Seven strikeouts for Aaron Harang. He and Gerald Laird are playing catch. And we head to the fourth. Nothing, nothing. Promo is quite apropos. Help the Braves strike out hunger before Friday games this year. It's sponsored by Kroger. 
Donate 20 cans of food or 20 bucks and you get an autograph. This Friday, infielder Ramiro Pena will be in the strikeout hunger tent in Monument Grove from 635 to 7 before the Braves take on the Reds. And we hope you'll join us. Johnson popped out his first time up and taps one to Echeverria Sunday hop took a look at the ball and threw it high at first and that cost him. Twenty first error for the Marlins and the second for Echeverria. He looked like he was counting the stitches on the baseball before he let that one go. Mm -hmm. So a break for the Braves. Here's Domitz. Ryan fly to center. His first time up. Strike. Inning ago or so, Domit lingered on the field for a few extra minutes and was talking with Jim Joyce out at second base. That conversation carried on until the Marlins began to take the field defensively. And Ryan made his way to the dugout. Freddie Gonzalez came out and talked with Joyce as well. Yeah, that was an odd one. It was right after Echeverria had been thrown out at second base, and at first I thought it was one of the middle infielders still standing there talking to Joyce, but it turned out to be Domit. Yeah, I thought it was one of the middle infielders too. No balls, two strikes. And Mathis, a nice stop. Johnson's going to try to advance, and he will because the throw sailed away from second. A good throw, I think, has him by plenty. It was a heck of a play. I mean, <laughs> you don't see that a throw on the run like that very often in this game, but especially from a catcher, he got a lot on it, but it it just sailed on him. Heck of a block. Kept it right in front of him and made it like an infielder. Braves have their second man in scoring position today on a wild pitch. And a hit by Domit could bring home Johnson. And fouled away. Here's what we saw about an inning ago with Ryan Domit and Jim Joyce. Hey guys, I'm told that Jim Joyce intercepted Ryan Domit on his way back to the Braves dugout. That was a bang bang play at second that ended the inning, and Joyce wanted the Braves to stay on the field, anticipating that the Marlins may challenge the call. He didn't want them to go back in the dugout. Domit was a little bit confused. That I, you know, I'm just trying to get off the field. I don't know why I need to stay. It ended up being a non-issue. The Marlins didn't challenge the call, but it's just a, another issue that's been raised by the replay system which was a hot topic of conversation once again in the Braves clubhouse before the game today along with their union rep Brandon Beachy who expects changes to come as early as next week especially in regard to the transfer rule. Two balls two strikes. Base hit up the middle the wild pitch is going to pay dividends here comes Johnson around to score Ryan Doman gives Atlanta a one nothing lead. Should have been a one out hit. Instead, an error, a wild pitch, and a single scores the game's only run. Again, missed his location just enough. Give Ryan a chance to bang that through the middle. I, I have a question for Tom on the, with respect to that transfer rule. Tom, if you're still there, uh, if you transfer within the division, do you still have <laughs> to sit out a semester? Uh, it depends. If it's a hardship waiver, then you're good to go. Okay. Drives one deep to left, but hit it too high. The edge. Right left, and he's got it. There's out number one. Back to first is Domit. Jordan Schaefer will be the hitter. 
We did have a transfer play replay in game one of the series. It did involve Dan Ugla. My biggest question about changing the rule or the interpretation is there have already been a lot of games decided by the current application of that rule. How do you change its interpretation with the pennant race already underway? But you can't get those changed games back. I say if you're going to do it, do it now so there aren't any more affected by it. Schaefer bounced out to third. Terrific play by McGee and on the grass to rob him of a hit. That was back in the brave second. No balls and a strike. Foul and out of play. Tom, you have more in your chat with Brandon Beachy? Yeah, and with other guys in the clubhouse, I mean, it differs depending on who you talk to. Gerald Laird told me yesterday he doesn't want to see the rule change. He thinks because of that it should stay the same way through the end of the season. Beachy says not only should it be changed, but it needs to happen soon. And the prevailing theory is that it may happen next week, which, of course, as you guys mentioned, leaves the window open for a full weekend of games for more issues to crop up and maybe teams to take losses where the outcome could have been different. Schaefer's down on strikes. That's the second out of the inning. I'm guessing the way that baseball could get around that is they can say, all right, we're going to allow the umpires to go back to the interpretation of the transfer play or the neighborhood play, whatever you want to call it, the way it was called for 50, 60, 100 years in the game, and simply make that play non-reviewable. Exactly. And that takes the argument away from the umpires. Takes away the replay mess. And I guess if there's a good thing that's come out of this confusion, to my knowledge, there's been nobody hurt on that play. Yeah, not yet. Right. I think there will be if it stays the way that it is. No balls and a strike. And that's downstairs to Laird, who guided a single through the right side in the second inning for the Braves. play two balls two strikes guys still a lot to learn about instant replay interesting nugget from Beachy today he said the last draft that he saw at the play as the players rep in spring training called for every time the manager to leave the dugout that would constitute a challenge so there was a surprise when the season started and that did not that was not the case Laird takes a call third strike he won't argue that call. He wants it for Aaron Harang, who now leads after four innings by a one nothing score.
was outstanding. And I'm sure it's a beautiful day to fly for our friends at Delta Airlines, proud sponsors of the Atlanta Braves. Looking forward to seeing Mac Coney and the gang on Sunday when we wrap up our series with the Cincinnati Reds. Miami makes its way to New York. They'll have an off day tomorrow. Then they open up a weekend series with the Mets at City Field. So Harang continues his role. He's faced the minimum through four. He's got Garrett Jones up there to start the fifth. Jones struck out to start the second inning. And a rare ball two count from Aaron Harang today. 49 pitches, 37 strikes. count with that wind blowing in even though it's a one run game this might be one of those times here where you just say here go ahead and hit it as far as you can to center field. There you go. Popped up to left Simmons is out. And look at the wind play with that. He almost overran that ball and he ran about 40 yards to try to get it. A tough win for Simmons and he knows that Domit's out there and left so he helped him out as best he could the best way he could by making the catch. And looking right up into the sun too. This is Casey McGee fourth in the league in RBIs. again and anything kind of borderline because he's just sitting in that spot he's getting the calls from Marvin Hudson today oh just missed until there. then yeah that one finished a little more off the plate Again, I asked earlier, what did Cleveland not see in Aaron Harang? Only they know. But you look at their early season pitching numbers, they're in the bottom third in the American League in ERA. They're dead last in fielding. And Harang, an ERA just under five while pitching in Arizona in the spring. I wonder how much more difficult it is to evaluate talent pitching in that hitter friendly spring paradise, Tom, because. He's been anything but friendly for hitters pitching back in the East. Yeah, there's no doubt the Indians could use him. Their starters ERA is over five. They only have four wins by the starters, second fewest in Major League Baseball. It wasn't the big league ballpark in baseball as it had an effect on Harang, but the minor league ones, late in his spring, they sent him to the backfields to throw a minor league game, and things got off to an okay start until they ran out of big league baseballs. Then Harang was forced to use minor league baseballs and if you're not familiar there's a different seam level there's a different texture a different feel and a different density to minor league baseballs harangue said he stuck with it as long as he could but after he spiked a couple sliders he tried to lift him a little bit then he started to get hit and got hit hard he said i didn't want to big league the umpire and i didn't want to make a scene out of it but he was competing for a job in the indians rotation so eventually he made a trip to the plate he asked the umpire if there was a any chance he could find some big league baseballs at which point the umpire apologized reached deep in the bag pulled a couple of pearls out by then maybe the Indians had already made up their mind. That's a great story. One ball one strike for Derek Dietrich. The skies one foul and out of play. Well surely someone would have told the Indians that that was the case wouldn't you think. Well you know that that 
Yeah, I think it's an unfortunate incident, but I would I would venture to say that regardless of what his numbers were leading up to that game, he was not throwing the ball the way he's been throwing it since he's been here in a Braves uniform. Otherwise, they would have said, we don't care about the numbers. To the right side and through, Dietrich has a two-out hit. And let's be honest, too. Different league, different rules. You don't have the pitcher here. You have another hitter in that other league. I would assume that it's a much more difficult league to pitch in from that standpoint. Well, it is. You know, DH, um, you know, the American League, you tend to pitch inside a lot more than you do in the National League. That certainly doesn't suit Aaron's game and, and his game plan. Um, you know, to me, it's, it's one of those things where we talk about it all the time. You know, what, what's the value of a change of scenery? <laughs> Clearly, in this case, there's huge value. He's comfortable here, and he's comfortable with this style of play. And, you know, obviously this organization has a long track record of pitching the way right. he's accustomed to pitching. Right. You know, Gavin Floyd pretty much said the same thing. I I'm paraphrasing, but with respect to his return from Tommy John surgery, he knew how the Braves valued pitching and how they took care of their pitchers, protected them, and he knew he would get that type of care and attention by coming here. Chavaria found a ball off his body. In hockey now, Help me out here, Tom. A lot of times they talk about a, an injury to a player. He had an upper body injury or a lower body injury. In the case of Echevarria and that foul ball, he had a lower body injury. Correct. He did, yes. Yeah. They're a lot more vague in hockey with their injuries. It's never a pulled hamstring or a sprained knee. It's upper body, lower body, and... That's I've all never heard of a strained flexor muscle <laughs> in hockey either. No. Strike three outside corner. Harang is painting pitch after pitch after pitch. That's his eighth. And the Braves still lead by a run. by The Amazing Spider-Man 2 in theaters May 2nd. Another well-pitched ball game, another one nothing ball game in Atlanta today, and here's how we've gotten to the bottom of the fifth, our Georgia Power game summary. How interesting that the only run of the game last night was scored in the fourth inning, the only run today so far was scored in the fourth inning, but on the good side for the Atlanta Braves, but Aaron Harang again just working Unbelievable how sharp he is today. He hasn't walked anybody. And he 
leads off Atlanta's fifth inning. The way things are going now, Nate Evaldi and Alex Wood are going to have a lot of things to talk about. Neither one getting much offense. All these scattered three Atlanta hits. Braves cashed in an Echeverria error and a wild pitch to score in the fourth. All these fifth strikeout gets his inning started. We go back to the top and Jason Hayward. Missed the news last night. The Angels beat the Nationals 7 2. Big night for Albert Pujols. Homer's number 499 and 500. Nats aren't scoring. They've lost four of their last six games and have scored 13 runs in that stretch. They're back at it tonight at 7 o'clock. After our off day, the Reds are in town over the weekend and the Reds' bats have come to life. They struggled mightily out of the gate offensively. But Cincinnati, in their last nine games, hitting 309 as a team and they're scoring more than six runs a game. Be a test for the Braves starting Friday as Jason Skies one out of play foul. One ball, two strikes. Tom, with the way uh, Aaron's pitching today, not a whole lot unlike what you the way you like to pitch, down and away, keep the ball away from people. Was there any type of hitter that made it made your life a little miserable in trying to do that? I, I don't say Tony Gwynn because I, I no, right. everybody. No, I was I would say <laughs> generally speaking the. The slap hitters would give me more trouble because they were there. Those guys are content with hitting the ball the other way and taking a single, you know, so they they were a little bit uh, they were a little bit more difficult. You know, a lot of guys have the approach that they want to go up there and OK, I'm going to look for something away. I'm going to take something away. But, you know, then they get that ball away and they guess right. They get giddy and they want to drive it and then they roll over and hit a nice ground ball. Mm -hmm. Foul by Hayward. He stays alive. It was, it was suggested oftentimes when you were still pitching that uh, a team ought to load up their lineup with left handers. And that was a little bit before you started throwing your change up more to uh, to left handers. Did anyone ever do that? I don't remember seeing anyone do it. No, nobody loaded up, but. Jason the other way. Echeverria can't get his glove down on that ball. And Hayward's aboard with one out. Coverage on that pitch. It was off the plate. But no, I did have some teams that, you know, maybe some of their left handers wouldn't sit as much. But, you know, generally speaking, most of the left handed hitters that you would face at that time were teams better hitters. So they weren't taking too many days off anyway. But, you know, I, I honestly, I loved it when a team would load up with just right handed hitters. I, I didn't like it as much when there was a mixture. I had to go back and forth to both sides of the plate. I, I loved yeah. it if it was all righties and I could just focus on one game plan. Simmons had a healthy cut and missed it. Strike one. On four hits for the Braves, no runs, two hits, and a costly Miami error. Fine score so far. Chan had a good question that he wrote on his uh, race board over there. Did you ever have a switch hitter turn around and hit left handed against you during a game that you can remember? Um, I think I did, but I don't, I don't remember who it was. Two. I mean, of course you got him out. I'm sure that was. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, I clearly I'd gotten him out enough right-handed that he <laughs> waved, the, waved, waved the right white flag right-handed and figured, hey, let me try the other side. Oh, and two. Simmons lined. This one is off the glove of Echeverria, I think. <laughs> yeah. And into left field. The Braves are hitting it to the right guy. He jumped too soon on that one. Well, I think that injury he suffered at the plate didn't allow him to bend over, and it won't allow him to jump. 
One went under his glove and this one just off the top of it. Good start to the inning. Back to back Braves hits. And now Freeman bats. Freddie over 13. And five strikeouts uncharacteristically for Freeman in the series. And a cue ball back to the mound. Evaldi to second for one, and the flip to first is in time for the double play. Echeverria caught that one and completed the double play. We move to the sixth. Time as we head to the sixth inning, all your long Braves baseball is brought to you by Academy Sports and Outdoors, the right stuff, the low price every day. Time for our trivia question. It's brought to you by AT&T Uverse. What current player has recorded the most career hits against Aaron Harang? I'm thinking Central Division. Mm -hmm. One try by Mathis. Johnson barehand. Fires on the run. High throw. And Freeman can't corral it. And Mathis is aboard with a leadoff bunt hit. If you've got a, a even a, a little bit of a bunting skill leading off the inning as an eight hole hitter, that's a great idea against a guy who's mowing your team down. Give your pitcher a chance. He wasn't able to bunt him over earlier. Run over Echeverria, but maybe you can do so here. Well, they couldn't move Echeverria over in the third. He bunted foul for strike three. Echeverria was thrown out trying to steal to end the inning. Tappers behind the plate foul. One and one. Boy, the art of bunting by National League pitchers. The state of bunting, if boy, I think, boy. has not been very good, has it? No. Not at all. You know, he'll try to help. Matt Butler was a terrific bunter in his big league career. I thought he was the best I ever saw. Mm hmm. Yeah, you figure with him over there that guys would be a little bit better at it, but anytime that's part of your game is to bunt and get on base, like bunt for a base hit, and they're playing in like Chris is playing in right now, and you still put it down that way and beat it out, you're pretty darn good. Evaldi tried to get out of the way, couldn't, and again bunts it foul for strike three.
Last night, I mean, that's two strikeouts charged to him because of the inability to bunt. But last night, you know, a lot, a lot is made about strikeouts for pitchers in the National League because they face the other pitcher, you know, in a game as opposed to having a DH. But last night, with all those strikeouts, there were only two strikeouts of the pitcher, both by Fernandez. He struck out in the third and the eighth. Alex Wood did not strike out. So you can't hang a lot of the strikeout total last night on facing a pitcher. Well, if you're Valdi and your team struggling to score your runs and you're in tight ball games, you better figure out how to get bunts down. Swing and a miss by Yelich again. The big story for Yelich. His 16 game hitting streak is on the line today and he is 0 for 2 and behind 0 and 2 here in the sixth. The thing I remember most about Brett Butler is to Joe's point everybody in the ballpark knew he was going to bunt and still he. Bunted his way to 2375 career hits. Wow that's a lot. And he was just so good at. Deadening, deadening that ball a quarter of the way up the third base line where it, you know, the third baseman's taking away the bunt as best you can without putting your life in danger that you might hit a line drive over there and he'd lay it down and still beat it up. And his his ability wasn't that he was already running down the line and throwing his bat out there. He's standing in the box and he was so precise he didn't care that you're playing in close. He waited. And put it at that spot Tom's talking about, and then beat it, beat it out. Yelich is down swinging for a second time. He struck out three times total, and it's a double-digit strikeout game for Aaron Harang. As good as that bunt was that he laid down last night against Alex Wood, I'm surprised he hasn't tried one today against Harang. Uh -huh. I think Harang's a much easier matchup for him to try and lay down a bunt on. A little more than 10% of Brett Butler's career hits were bunt hits, 245 of them, Gretchen tells us. The other part of Butler's game that was so dynamic 558 career stolen bases. Five times over 40. He had two years with 39 and one with 38. So Zuna swings and misses. Rang is putting on a pitching clinic. Brett went from Atlanta along with a busload of other players for Lynn Barker to Cleveland. A fly out of play. Ozuna's set up now. Ball and two strikes. Butler that 245 bunt total. The most bunt hits in baseball history. Didn't know that. Thank you Gretchen. One ball two strikes for Ozuna. Third and a big hop bounces past Chris Johnson. That thing had a kangaroo hop on it, didn't it? A lot of top spin. So the first real bit of trouble for Aaron Harang now. And big trouble in the box in Giancarlo Stanton, who has struck out twice. Having this kid healthy is good for baseball. He's a superstar in the making. Unbelievable power. He's hit the longest home run in the big leagues this year. 26 RBIs in the first 20 games for Miami. 
but hasn't been able to solve the Braves in this ballpark. This has not been a good place for Stanton to do much damage. Hitting in the low 200s at Turner Field. One ball, one strike. Joe, I don't remember watching Frank Howard hit the Washington Monument, but this guy, I guess, would be the closest approximation in our game. Big giant 6'7", six six Giancarlo Stanton, 265 pounds. Speaking of his power. Frank had about 35 pounds on him. He, he was 300 pounds. He was a monument. Frank was a big man. <laughs> two balls, two strikes. Did he go? No swing. That was a big pitch. Like he held it. Oh, I don't know. Got a little flip out there. Runners will go with two outs. And Stanton bloops one into shallow center. That's no man's land, and no man's going to get it. One run scores, and Stanton will glide into second base with a blue pit on a full count pitch to tie the game. Ozuna came streaking around the third base bag, but Brett Butler stopped him with two outs. And at the very least, Miami has now even the score. And that bunt single to start the inning. That's how this all got started by the catcher. Seventh RBI for Stanton. He's at second. Ozuna's at third. And here's Garrett Jones. Drive foul into the seats. Strike one to Jones. Remember last time up, he fell behind Jones. 3 0, oh, got to a 3 1 count, got him to pop up. It's ahead of him here, even with the base open. Looks like he's the guy they want to go after. Maybe. Zuna, Stanton, Jones, and McGee all with 10 or more RBIs for the Marlins. Jones, the man, stuck on 10. He's got two opportunities here. Down to his last strike with two outs. One and two the count. Bullpen's beginning to stir now.
Jones struck out. 11 strikeouts for Aaron Harang, but Miami ties the game with a run on three hits. from the biggest man in the lineup Giancarlo Stanton time for our Academy Sports and Outdoors leaderboard got to manufacture some offense in game three if the Braves are to win the series that's not a good sign when you when you look at the standings of those other two ball clubs Houston seven and fourteen in last place in their division and the Angels while they've got a pretty potent offense not so do, doing so well out west either. That's that's one of those stats where it's good to be able to do it, but you don't want to rely on it. The Braves this year when they hit a home run, 12 wins, one loss. That's great. When they don't hit a home run, they're one and six. Johnson, Domit, and Ugla. Chris has scored the only Braves run. Domit brought him in with a RBI single. And Johnson is down on strikes. Both clubs might want to order new bats for the next series because these aren't working too well. On the contrary, I think they're unused at this point, Mike. Well, that's they're, they're, just, they're, good, that's, they're good to go. Yeah. How do you like a new batch of bats? I don't know. I haven't made contact. <laughs> Six strikeouts for Evaldi today. And he's ahead of Ryan Doman. Well, it's been some pretty darn good pitching. 28 strikeouts yesterday combined. So far, we're up to 17 in this game. Sixty eight total is in a three game series three nine inning games according to Gretchen is the record sixty eight and we're at sixty seven right now. That's low one ball two strikes. I was going to guess maybe Kerry Wood, Mark Fryer, and Carlos Zambrano. No. No. 
However, me and who else? Yes. You, really? <laughs> no. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> no chance. Man, oh man, his, his eyebrows shut up like, yeah. wow, really? really? <laughs> what? Uh huh? Me and strikeouts were not up off in a conversation, so. No, uh, 68 was done by Colorado at Florida. Wow. August of 2009. That's the most since they started keeping the records in 1914 for such things. 82 is the all time record, but that included extra inning games between Detroit and Seattle. Doesn't say what year. Actually, last year, 2013. Hmm. Dome it. Grounds to short. Chiparia takes no chances and gets rid of it quickly and accurately. Two outs. Okay, Tommy. Yep. 96. The most K's in a Braves three game series with extra innings included is 73, done twice in August of 2013 against Washington here. That figures. And in August of 96 at Los Angeles against the Dodgers. You had to factor in there. I don't know. Smolty Maddox. I don't know. Pete Smith. No, he wasn't here then. Smolty Mad Dog. Channel find it for us. Zero oh and two for Ugla. Evaldi up to his old tricks against the Braves. The run he's given up today is unearned. Means he's given up two earned runs against Atlanta in the last 34 and two thirds innings. But only a one and one record lifetime against the Braves. High towering fly ball to left. Dan pulled it. Head to the seats. All right, we have the, the three pitchers for Atlanta. In order, Smoltz, Maddox, Glavin. Wow. What that? I want that on the plaque. Exactly. <laughs> Any idea how many you had? I didn't until Chan started giving me a hard time. <laughs> six. That's a lot for me. Six strikeouts, six walks that day. Good stuff. Couldn't control it. <laughs> it <was moving> all <laughs> <laughs> Jack swing into the seats. Well, if you had six, those other guys were dealing. Yeah, they were. <laughs> <laughs> Three balls, two strikes for Ugla. Base is empty, two outs. One game went 18 innings. That helped. Yeah, that helped. one at 98. I want to thank our friend Aaron Charlton from Stats Inc. with all these. Oh. Man. I was right in the shoulder blade or rib cage. Was at first for Schaefer, so Aaron Charlton, thank you very much. We've had so many obscure stats pop up in the last couple of weeks of this 2014 season. We do appreciate all the research those folks do for us. Before this one's done, we'll probably have a few more requests the way things have gone head to head with the Marlins so far. He 
Evaldi over 100 pitches now. That one at 95 miles an hour. Yeah, his high for the year has been 102. So, kind of figure this is probably the last inning for him. Big hole right side for Schaefer if he can fill it. And now he's down to his final strike. He's just a just a touch late. He's taking a good cut at it, but he's just a little tardy. And he's been swinging the bat real well off the bench over the last four or five opportunities. A little late. That strikeout number 68 in the series. Amazing. Evaldi with seven, Harang with 11. The grounds crew will manicure the diamond for the seventh. Braves and Marlins 68 combined strikeouts through six innings in game three today. And Aaron Harang back out there for Atlanta in the seventh inning. A 1 1 score with McGee, Dietrich, and Echevarria coming up. Braves have activity in their bullpen backing up Harang, Avilan, and Carpenter, I believe. I mean, you've got to figure, guys, with three innings left and the arms left in both of these bullpens, that 68 number is going to be not just beaten, but maybe obliterated. You would think so. The Marlins have activity in their pin, too. Carlos Marmol is the batter, and McGee walks on four pitches to start the inning. It's the first walk for Harang and the second walk combined in the game. That's the other thing about these strikeout totals. We've seen excellent control from these pitchers. It's the first walk by an Atlanta pitcher in this series since Kimbrell walked to batter leading off the ninth inning in game one. So Roger McDowell talks things over with Aaron Harang. 
while they chat we invite you to take a guided tour of Turner Field and visit many areas you don't get to see during the game like the Braves press box Tom Glavin's Hall of Fame seat in our broadcast booth clubhouse and the dugout tours are offered year round in the Braves Museum and Hall of Fame call 404 614 2013 to plan your tour today you get to the booth you might even get to sit on our physio seats yeah in the booth I've been left out of the physio seat so far we can arrange it well, my core is pretty good right Academy now. Sports and Outdoors they right sell stuff them. yeah the low price low every, day. every day every okay. day trouble is not around here we'll find you one okay you want red or red oh I have to have red you guys have red I have to have red now when you're gone and Smoltz is here can he use it or does he have to bring his own those are things you really got to think about I'll share okay. so Derek Dietrich is the hitter for Miami he's one for two this guy's had good luck against the Braves in this ballpark he's three for nine coming in all those hits were doubles Instead of Carpenter with Avilan. Carlos Marmol up for the fish. Little flare into shallow right. That's going to drop in front of Hayward. And McGee will play it station to station. And now Miami's in real business. Two on with nobody out. And you've got Echeverria coming up. You know, he'd like to atone for his throwing error. Laird wanted it in, tie him up, but he left it upstairs, a sign he may be tiring, and that's going to do it for him. 101 pitches for Aaron Harang, who will depart the game, allowing a run on six hits. McGee and Dietrich are his responsibility, but Harang another gem. Aaron struck out 11 men so far today. The Georgia Lottery, Toyota, and AT&T. Well-deserved ovation for Aaron Harang, who salutes the crowd. Another terrific outing by the Braves' right-hander. And he'll turn things over now to the Braves' bullpen with two on and nobody out. Harang's performance today is our Zaxby's indescribably good play, and understandably so. Harang struck out 11 men, walked only one over his six-plus innings of work today. Sharp again. I mean, using all his pitches, both sides of the plate. 
11 strikeouts against the one walk this inning. Just needs a little help from the bullpen right here to get out of this. And we'll see if Echeverria is bunting. You know what's amazing about this game is the different ways pitchers or hitters can accomplish the same thing. Last night we retreated to Jose Fernandez just throwing 97 mile an hour fastballs past hitters. Aaron Harang doesn't throw 97. Relies on pinpoint control and movement and had very similar results. This guy Jordan Walden has been good lately too. Speaking of 98. He's got the seven, eight, and nine spots for Miami. Echeverria was talking for a long time in the on deck circle with Brett Butler. You've got the catcher Mathis waiting on deck with nobody out. And he is going to try to bunt, and he was way late. Now Butler looks in at Mike Redmond. Is it on or not? I'd, I'd like to see Jordan just air, keep airing out his best fastball because it's so hard to control, let alone get down a bunt. My guy's throwing this hard. He bunted it in the air but fell back to the screen. Now Brent Butler. Will again talk to Echeverria. Is the bunt still on with two strikes? Based on those two attempts, I hope so. Yeah. He's not butting, he's not hitting either. Echeverria blown away with a 97 mile an hour fastball. And now let's see, is Mathis going to be called back? He will be. Couldn't bunt it, couldn't hit it. That was just some gas. So Saltalamakia will grab a bat. He'll hit for Mathis. The great thing about the strikeout for Walden is the double play is now in order if the Braves can get it. Head to the home seven, still tied. That was the record breaking strikeout, too, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, 69. So here's Salty, a 259 average, a couple of homers, five RBIs. Former Brave playing in his first series as a visitor at Turner Field. Two balls and a strike. He's had a lot of life on this fastball. We're kind of seeing Jordan Walden that we saw early in his career in Anaheim. And now that he's healthy, we're able to see what he's fully capable of. Two and two. Struck him out. What was that? I don't know, but it was a good spot for it. <laughs> Something off speed. It, was, it looked like a split, but I guess it's just a straight change. Yeah. Man, oh man. So Miami goes to its bench. Greg Dobbs. Really good pinch hitter. Do so for Evaldi here in the seventh. Miami had him first and second. Nobody out. Echeverria and Saltalamakia have struck out. 
And now Dobbs the final hope if the Marlins are to grab a lead here. Always like this guy. It's tough out. Yeah. Right now they're swinging at the invisible baseball from Walden. They can't pick his stuff up at all. Well, this guy's such a good first pitch fastball hitter, and he's a good low fastball hitter. That was a great call by Gerald Laird there to come back with that off speed pitch to start him. So a good example of using a guy's strengths in the situation against him. You know he's a good fastball hitter or runners in scoring position. He wants to hit a fastball so start him off speed. Isn't it fun to think along with Laird behind the plate too. I know you appreciate that Tommy mm -hmm. and his game calling skills. Yeah, he's done a. Done a real good job today of. Mixing things up and you know the, the telltale sign is even for a guy like Aaron Durang who's only throwing 91 92 he's. He's getting swings at his fastball like he's throwing 98. Which tells you that he's. Done a nice job of mixing his speeds and, and pitches. Outside corner to the active pinch hitting leader in baseball Greg Dobbs. Again their bench is so much improved. Yeah. They already had Dobbs, but now having Reed Johnson right handed coming off to pinch it or fill in. He has 96 career pinch hits, including one this year. But not this time. Jordan Walden came in and struck out the side swinging. Incredible. The Braves have struck out 14 Marlins, none bigger than the last three. Seventh inning stretch, tie game, one apiece. Sends it to the home half where we remain tied and a run apiece. We hope you'll become a 2014 Braves season ticket holder. Packages begin at just 20 games and you'll get 33% off concessions at Turner Field and exclusive access to fan experiences you'll never forget. Go to Braves.com slash season tickets or call 404-577-9100. Jim Mishadik is standing by to answer all of your Braves ticket questions. You know what the Marlins call this guy's relief? Marmalade. And well, he's been pretty good for him. After some real rough times with the Chicago Cubs, Marmol figured some things out with the Dodgers and is on for the tenth time this season in a Miami uniform. Well, this will be uh, an interesting adjustment for the hitters. Seen some guys the last <laughs> couple of days that can bring it and can locate it, and I would. Be pretty comfortable in putting this guy, classifying him as the effectively wild kind of guy. So we'll see if the Braves can uh, be patient and let him get himself in some trouble. That's what you guys were talking about the other night with Marmol. You can really outweigh him. Yeah, you can almost go in the batter's box and. 
dare him to throw three strikes before he before he's going to throw four balls. So Lamakia remains in the game behind the plate for Miami. And Justin Upton has grabbed a bat. He will bat for Jordan Walden after Laird's at bat is concluded. Up, out of play, and into the seats. One and two. There are days where Marmol can come out and strike you out on nine, strike out the side on nine pitches too, when he's on. But those days are sometimes pretty scattered. Laird to short at Chivaria smothers. Throws out the Braves catcher for out number one. Here's Justin Upton. Guys, on days like this where the managers shuffle their lineups a little bit, it must really be fun to play with the toys that you have on your bench and be able to use a guy like Justin Upton or Jared Saltalamaki anytime you want in the late innings of a close ball game. Now it's Freddie's turn with Upton and one out. I know those, I remember those days when Chipper didn't play and he just wondered. I know the other manager was always wondering when is he going to use him. So Upton stands in with a 303 average. Five home runs. This is his first pinch hit assignment of the year. He was thinking home run and didn't get it. Strike one. Had good numbers against Marmol. Three for seven coming into this series. Saw him after the game last night, and Justin had a wry smile on his face as he was walking out. And I just said, Well, sure looked fun from where we were sitting. <laughs> and I told him about the record uh, of strikeouts combined. He said, Well, I get I did my share. <laughs> Yet and full of strikeouts against Fernandez, too. Yeah, he's had a stretch of Games where he has struck out too much for him. I think eight of his last 11 at bats have been strikeouts, and nine of his last 13. Two balls and a strike. Now, two and two. a low risk high reward guy for Miami. And he just got up into swing and miss. Two up two down in the seventh and back to the top of the order and Jason Hayward who has two singles and three tries. I was talking to Tommy Hutton. Uh, one of the television yahoos like us over for the Marlins and he said you know we were discussing coming in here to face the Braves and we thought boy we're going to be facing some really good pitching Braves starters are really good and he said you know all of a sudden we were, as we were talking about there was saying, well, you know what we're running three pretty good guys out there now too I believe this Marlins team can be a dark horse in this division in some capacity whether winning it or wild card second wild card because of what you just said their pitching is moving on up real quickly what will be very interesting I think is at the trade deadline or near it if they are in the hunt with this starting pitching if they will be willing to go out and maybe get a bullpen piece or a position player that helps them offensively. Their offense is much improved. Hayward took a strike. But they've got some spots where they could shore up. They're going to get for call back too. Let's not forget that. Yeah. And 
whatever Rafi's got left, the impact he could have on this club could be significant. Yeah, they hang around and start to get a little confidence in themselves. They can be dangerous. That sounds familiar, I'm sure. Thinking yes. back to the early 90s. But I remember what Tommy was talking about after our game last night, or maybe before the game. September, nobody's going to want to face these guys. Nope. That pitching staff. Something interesting to think about in September. First, the 2 2 pitch. Which missed. The Braves will play the Marlins the first weekend in September. Should the division race come down to the Braves and Nationals, seven of the last ten games head to head for Washington are with Miami. Including the final three at Marlins Park. I take that back. Final three in Washington. And Hayward coaxes a two out walk. There's the wild marmal who spun out of that delivery and might have hurt himself. Grabbing his hammy. Still grabbing at it. His right one. Luis Avilan has done something similar to that for the Braves, and it turned out to be a cramp. Sean Cunningham is the Marlins head certified athletic trainer. He's the man on the base of the mound with Marmol. And I don't think uh, Carlos is going to be allowed to continue. Miami did make a roster move today. They sent uh, Caminero down to the minor leagues and brought up Carter Caps from AAA New Orleans. They have done loosening up, but that doesn't mean they've got to go to him. And it is going to be Mike Dunn. And with Marmol leaving because of injury, Dunn will have as much time as he needs to get loose here in the seventh. Georgia Power, The Home Depot, and Zaxby's Indescribably Good. Fans, it's time now for you to tweet your photo using hashtag SouthFanPhoto to sh have a chance to have it shown in an upcoming broadcast. Sorry, Brought to you by AT&T. So former Brave Mike Dunn will take his time and get loose. There have been some good stories in the Marlins bullpen, most notably their closer, Steve Ciszek. Dunn is off to a slow start. And 
And it was done, you'll recall, the other night that gave up a big hit to Jason Hayward on an 0-2 count in the seventh inning that allowed the Braves to tie the game. Or take the lead, I should say, 2-1. to one. A game Atlanta eventually won 4-2 on Evan Gaddis' first big league walk-off home run. Anderton Simmons will be the first batter he faces who is a right-handed hitter, but as much as anything could be that Mike Redman wanted to bring the left-hander in, just perhaps keep Jason Hayward from having any thoughts of getting a good jump. A one for three day for Simmons today, hitting second behind Hayward and in front of Freeman. Mike Dunn can be wild too. Make sure you get a good pitch. And he was with that one way outside. One ball, no strikes. Arizona and the Cubs are underway at Wrigley Field today. All the other National League Baseball is under the lights. Washington hosts the Angels. The Phillies get Cole Hamels back tonight. He faces the Dodgers. Got a pretty nice crowd here for a midday. Great mid crowd. What was the attendance? 21,508. That is a great crowd. No, my son Peyton and his classmates are found a little time here at the end of the day to watch the Braves game as well. So say hello to those guys and good. See if you guys can find a way for the Bravos to get a win here, get a run or two. One ball, two strikes. And Simmons, a rare strikeout, only his third this season. Braves out of luck in the seventh. Top of the Marlins order up in the eighth. Still tied 1 1. Side 1 1. Joe Simpson, Tom Glavin, Tom Hartship carry with you from Turner Field. We hope you'll join us to celebrate the unsung heroes of the military this Saturday when the Braves host the Reds. Military Appreciation autographed jerseys will be auctioned off on Braves.com to benefit the Wounded Warrior Project. Get your tickets today at Braves.com. This is Luis Avilon. Third pitcher of the day for Atlanta. The first two, Harang and Walden, struck out 14 Marlins in the first seven innings. And he 
reprieve for Christian Yelich, who's 0 for 3 today, but another chance to extend his hit streak. And it's a bunt. And Avilan off the mound, stumbles, throws to first, and not in time. Yelich for a second game in a row extends his hitting streak with a beautiful bunt. That'll make Brett Butler proud. And it's interesting. I mean, we just talked about how he didn't, yep. he didn't make an attempt off a of harangue, but now here he is, second attempt at a series, both against lefties. So, and that's, you know, I mean, it's it's smart. Typically, you get left handers, they fall off the mound a little bit. You get that ball down the first baseline, it's tough to change your direction and go get it. And then Avalon had a tough time there. It's a great weapon. Especially if you feel like there's a lefty that you, you're scuffling against or don't handle very well. And if they dare pitch you inside, just take it with you. So it sets up for Marcelo Zuna. He's one for three. Giancarlo Stanton on deck. 1-1, one, one, Miami's eighth inning. So Yelich by himself now has the longest hit streak this year in the National League. Adrian Gonzalez had a 16 game hit streak stopped April 21st. He's got a hit streak and a steal streak going. See if, yeah. he, see if he has any inkling to try and steal a bag here. At the knees, a beautiful pitch. One ball, two strikes. Yelich is 22. Ozuna is 23. Giancarlo Stanton, the man in the on deck circle, been around a while. He's only 24. It's a pretty good core. We build in your club room. Line drive into center field. Knocked down by Ugla. Simmons at the bag. Flipped to first. Not in time. Ugla cut it off and flipped to Andrelton for the first out of the inning. And that ball fooled me to be honest with you. I thought it was hit a lot harder than it was. Now Andrelton couldn't get anything on his throat from the angle he had to take that toss from Dan. But the fact Dan was able to cut it off and keep it from bouncing into center field helped out a lot. So one on one out and Stanton takes low. Stanton's bloop double in the sixth accounted for the only Miami run. And that one got away. So that hurts Ozuna to second on a very wild pitch. Tommy you picked it up immediately on our ball. It's a right hamstring strain. That's why he left. Well, hopefully me nothing serious. And Braves put stance on. Yeah. Sixth intentional walk for Giancarlo. Two on one out and another lefty lefty matchup. 
Jones is 0 for 3 with a couple of strikeouts. You said that was his sixth intentional walk mm -hmm. on the season. Yep. It's more than he had all of last year already. Five and a. 116 games last year. Look out. Broken bat. The barrel ended up past Dan Ugla. It sent Stanton tumbling to the seat, to his seat of his pants, and the baseball ended up behind the bet the uh that was, middle plate. That was very odd. I don't know if I've ever seen one like that before because everybody was looking for the baseball. Yeah, I, th I think Stanton thought the bat was the ball. That's why he Kind of kept going and then realized I'm about to get killed here. Well, I mean, even jo Jones didn't know where it was. Yeah. When you see the barrel fly, you'd kind of think the ball's going in the same yeah. general direction. So no balls and a strike. Two on, one out. And popped up. Chris Johnson flips the shades down, foul ground, and gets there. Jones has had trouble against left handed pitching this year, and that continues here in the eighth. He pops out. McGee will be the hitter, and Freddy Gonzalez has a right hander ready to face him. So Avilon gives up a hit, a walk, and a wild pitch. But so far, the two Marlins are still aboard in this tie game in the eighth inning. We're back to Atlanta right after this. Tie game at one apiece. Let's head back to our AT&T Universe trivia question. What current player has the most career hits against Aaron Harang, who started the game for the Braves today? I've got a guess. Okay. And it's topical. I'm going to go Albert Pujols. Good call. I was trying to think of central guys, too. I know Aramis Ramirez was an answer once this year, so I'm not going to go to him. I'm going to say Soriano. And I will say Aramis Ramirez. Milwaukee, so are we right? Good call, Joe. Albert Pujols with 27 hits. By the way, Padna. So you got to think like Gretchen thinks. Right. You know, I don't know if I ever want to do that as David Carpenter. <laughs> no, that's really a good point. He's in for the 10th time. Well, he was good last night. Struck out two of the three guys he faced in the ninth inning. And these hitters are seeing fastball after fastball after fastball.
Let's look at McGee's picture profile on the high definition scoreboard at first glance reminds me a little bit of Kent Merker. Yeah, a little bit. Fly foul now two and two. We were all over that trivia, by the way. Yeah, we were. Well, you and Joe were. Team effort. Foul. We had the number one guy, the number two guy, and the number 18 guy. <laughs> All time against Terang in hit totals. Funny last night. I was walking to the parking lot to my car. I walked by Roger McDowell and I said, Boy, what a game. Sorry to come up short on that one. What a game. He goes, Yeah, that's a tough one. He said, By the way, I had Kevin Brown too. On <laughs> 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 last night's oh, trivia. Nice. <laughs> Three and two, runners go, and a tapper foul. You know, you forget about Ryan Dempster and how good of a pitcher he was. He had the Tommy John surgery. Was with Cincinnati at the time. The Cubs picked him up, made him their closer, and he wanted to start, kind of like John Smoltz. Right. Put him in rotation and he had several more excellent years as a major league starting pitcher. Three two again. McGee drives it to right. Hayward gets there. That ball carried out to the Braves' right fielder, and he makes the play, and that retires the side. Part of the order up for Atlanta in the eighth. All-star Freddie Fril Freeman has had his aggressiveness pay off throughout his career. That was evident last season especially. As we take a look at our Home Depot tools from the dugout, he hit 455 with six home runs and 28 driven in on the first pitch of an at-bat. Hasn't happened for him yet this season. Just two for 14 with only one driven in when he swings at that first pitch. Chip? 
And Tom, if I could chime in, uh, there's been a couple recently where he has come up and on the first pitch hit into double plays in key situations on the first pitch. That's just another thing that makes him so tough to pitch to, I would think. Is he swinging or is he not? Because mm -hmm. he's more than happy to take a walk if need be. He's quickly down a strike to Mike Dunn. Here in the Atlanta eighth. Right guys at the right time for the Braves. Three, four, and five in a tie game at one. Down the middle, and Freeman took it. Freddie's he's on that. He's in between on everything right now. He's a little out front on some pitches, and then all of a sudden, when he's thinking off speed or thinking trying to stay back, and then he gets one of these. Braves were taking some different type of batting practice today on the field, and it was their soft toss, if you will. They had screen set up on each side of home plate and then just soft tossing from about 20 feet away. It's pretty interesting. As Greg Walker has said before, Freddie's swing is so good that usually if he hits a rough patch, he just needs a little soft toss to get back in the swing of things. Haven't seen Freddie shake his head on it all at the plate. He'll be back. He'll figure it out. Yep. You know, he, like Joe said, he just looks like he's a little bit caught in between both on selection and whether or not he wants to be aggressive or see a few pitches. Chris Johnson's the only brave to score today. He reached on an Echeverria throwing error. Took second on a wild pitch and scored on Ryan Domit's hit. So an unearned run is the only run the Braves have scored today. They've totaled five hits. 80 Valdi started for Miami. Six innings of five hit, one run ball. He struck out six. Again, Tom mentioned several times Evaldi, the lowest supported starting pitcher in baseball. Got one run today. Marmol and now Dunn have followed. Aaron Harang started for the Braves and pitched another brilliant game. He faced the minimum through the first four innings and two thirds. Struck out 11 men, six hits, only one walk. Left with two on, nobody out in the seventh. Jordan Walden came in, struck out the next three hitters, swinging and in order. And Luis Avilan and David Carpenter took care of matters in the top of the eighth. Harang joins a pretty select list, guys, of starting pitchers who have started the season with at least five starts, allowing one run or less in each of those starts. Dizzy Dean, Pedro Martinez, Dutch Leonard, Al Benton, Don Sutton. Bob Nepper and Fernando Valenzuela. Valenzuela did it seven times. Johnson walks. There's the wildness of Dunn. First base runner, he's allowed. So, 10 consecutive quality starts for the Braves staff. As a pinch runner will come in for Chris Johnson, it's Romero Pena. And, guys, the most remarkable stat of all, I think, is. Another start by a Braves hurler allowing less than two earned runs. It's 20 of the first 21 games now. That's fabulous. Yeah, it's again, it's it's impressive if you have your full assortment of guys you thought you were going to have, you know, it's even more impressive with the guys and the injuries they've had to deal with. 
strike to Domit. It's one for three and has the Braves RBI. It also says that if you'd been able to scratch out a few more runs, you might be 21 and one. Mm -hmm. Or 20 and one, I guess, after 21 games. Well, you allow one or two, you only have to score two or three to win. That's pretty much been the recipe for the Braves, who have outscored their opposition by 24 runs so far this year. And Doma didn't get it. No balls, two strikes. He was ahead of Johnson 0 and 2 and walked him. He's just going to have to battle up there and see if he can get a good pitch to hit, even 0 and 2. Too close to take, so he fought it off and fouled it to the right side. Blocked that and kept Pena at first. Both teams are off tomorrow. The Braves will stay in town and wait for the Reds. Marlins will head up to New York after the game and enjoy an off day in New York City. in a stretch of 15 of their next 18 games at home. After that red series we have a three gamer down in Miami then we're home for the Giants Cardinals and Cubs to begin the first days of May. Popped up. The wind has been blowing hard toward right all day and it'll push that ball into the sunshine. Doma is putting up a fight with two strikes and a one two count. Domit goes down swinging. Third strikeout for Dunn. Two outs. And here's the fun matchup. These are the two men traded for each other. Dunn versus Ugla. Omar Infante was also part of that deal that was wrapped up November 16th, 2010. 
and then signed a contract extension that takes him through the 2015 season for the Braves. I think Omar is off to a decent start with Kansas City too after signing with him as a free agent. I know he missed a few days after he got hit in the face with a pitch. It was very fortunate that it wasn't as serious as it could have been. Kansas City is 10 and 9 in a game back at Detroit entering play today. Well, kind of a trendy pick to win the Central this year. Yeah. The, the Royals. Yep. They feel like they finally have the pitching that can carry them. Omar's hitting 290. Thanks, Chan. One ball, no strikes. Pena at first. And now, two and zero. Oh. The biggest divisional lead in baseball is owned by Milwaukee. The Brewers at 15 and six have the best record in baseball. They lead the Cardinals by three games. The Reds by five and a half. The Pirates nine and twelve so far. After making the playoffs last year, they're already six games off the pace in the division. Dodgers by a half game over Colorado out west. The Giants 11 and 10 are a game back. And San Diego, they're getting excellent pitching too with a very sluggish offense. The Padres are only two out. And you know about Arizona's troubles. 5 and 18. Worst record in baseball. Dan took that low. Gauge how well a guy is doing by how many hits he's getting with Ugla. Gauge him by how well he's taking and how many times he's walking. He should get a good pitch to hit here. Even though he's got three strikeouts, Dunn's a little all over the place. He needs to prove one here for Dan. Bouncing ball off the pitcher's glove. Dietrich couldn't get the handle. By keeping that ball on the infield, he may have kept Pena at second base. That'll be an infield hit for Ugla. And the Braves have a threat with two outs. Left-hander was due up, Schaefer, but he's been called back. Gaddis is going to pinch hit. The Marlins also have A.J. Ramos ready in their bullpen if they want to make a move. There is Ramos. Mike Redman wants to make sure that he's been announced. Evan Gaddis leads all Braves in batting average against the Marlins. Granted, he's only played 12 games, but Gaddis 16 hits and 45 at bats, including four homers and 15 RBIs. So Gaddis is going to face off with Ramos in the eighth. Still tied one apiece.
Mattis will be called on to pitch it. And the legend of El Oso Blanco grew here just a couple of nights ago. That's our Georgia lottery hitting the jackpot. His first Major League walk-off homer. Tom? Guys, George Brett was a Hall of Fame hitter that didn't wear batting gloves, but as we all know, he used plenty of pine tar. Evan Gaddis doesn't use any pine tar, no batting gloves. He'll just reach down to the dirt every once in a while, grab a fistful of it, and dry off his hands. I checked out his bats before the game. They're as clean as when they came out of the box. It doesn't seem to bother El Oso Blanco. Hands that big, you don't need a lot of grip or grip help. Gaddis takes outside from A.J. Ramos. Ramos faced him here Monday night and walked him. He's going to see a steady dose of those. Yeah, he, his out pitch to right handers is a slider. Already two. Stop eliminating any chance to get Ugla and Gaddis off the bench with a big RBI hit. And the Braves now lead 3 1. And here's Lair. I mean, if you want to show him a fastball to keep him honest, then throw it in the dirt, throw it head high down the middle, whatever you want to do. But you're not going to sneak it by, you're not going to fool him. I don't know if they were going to have a play on Dan plate. That second run was pretty important. And that errant throw from Yelich into the infield was costly. Giving me give them even a chance to throw out of him. Swing and a miss for Gerald Lair. I'm assuming Kimbrell is up in the Braves pen now. He is. And he'll have the bottom part of the Miami order in the ninth inning. Braves break through with two in the eighth. A walk, an infield hit, and a ringing double by Gaddis. And Laird is down on strikes. Ramos gets his man, but one hitter too late. Evan Gaddis continues to pummel the Marlins pitching staff. A two run double sets it up for Craig Kimbrell going to the ninth.
Greg Kimbrell's hoping this trip from the Braves bullpen is a happier one. It's no secret his last two times out have been a struggle for him. However, as Joe mentioned the other night, looking at the silver lining, Kimbrell did strike out three guys. Yeah, it's like Tommy said, um, after he had given up the damage, he was like, okay, enough of this. And he just started airing it out and started firing the ball and quit worrying about it. Yeah, I think his, his, you know, his outing in New York, I think, is understandable. He hadn't been out there. It wasn't a safe situation. He's trying to get his feet back on the ground. And the next thing you know, everything goes haywire. And then the other night, it, it just seemed like in his first safe situation back, it was... I don't want to say timid, but I think he was pitching a little bit more not to make mistakes. Yeah. And then once that run was given up, it was, and I've been there, you flip that switch where you're just like, all right, enough of this, and you start pitching to get guys out. So for me, if, if, if I'm him, I remember those last three hitters from the other night, and that's my mentality, and that's my approach. I love what you said, too, Tommy. Let's not forget, he's human. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's, his, the expectation level that he set is so high. Um, you know, hey, it's, it's a good thing that we're shocked that he's had two so-so items in a row. Optins in center. Pena's at third for Derek Dietrich. And Kimbrell's first pitch right on the money. And this is the guy that did the damage. An opposite field double. No balls and a strike in the Miami ninth. That bounces up there for an even count. Heavy workload, Tom, last time out for Craig, huh? Yeah, really, the last two times out, 54 pitches over his last two outings. Monday, a 30 pitch outing. He's only reached that mark four times in his career. I talked to him yesterday. He said, That's a lot of pitches for me, but he was surprised how good he felt at the ballpark yesterday and told me he could have thrown last night. So good to go today. Fly ball, shallow right. And Hayward paddles the sun, makes the play, and there's the first down. As promised earlier today, we have our AT&T fan photo of the game. Tweet your photo to hashtag South Fan Photo. A chance to be shown in an upcoming game broadcast could be yours. It's brought to you by AT&T. Here's Echeverria. He's one for three. And a costly throwing error led to a Braves run today. Foul back, strike one. So this sets up really nicely for Kimbrell. Off day yesterday, pitches today, off day tomorrow, weekend series with the Reds, off day next week in Miami. That breaking ball for a strike, and he didn't try to overcook it. He mm -hmm. had a nice, simple, easy delivery on it. That yeah, was more of a, almost like a let me throw it for a strike versus that one that just kind of burrows down into the dirt. And that one burrowed into Laird's glove. A blazing fastball at 96 miles an hour. And now Miami down to its final out, and it's Jared Saltalamacchia. But back to that breaking ball, it wasn't like he was trying to throw it as hard as he throws his fastball. Even his arm action was a little different, and he got good results from it. Two balls, no strikes.
Kimbrell's one more away. I've seen this guy before. Yeah. Nice to see him back. The 2 2 pitch. Reed Johnson's grabbed a bat. He's on deck for the Marlins. The Braves want to see him next week. Takes care of Salt to Lavacchio. What a series. If you like strikeouts, you saw by, as I said, the bushel basket full. Atlanta takes two out of three from Miami. Braves now 14 and 7 on the year. And they beat the Marlins in a thriller. 3-1, the final score.